Reliability and validity can be assessed using multiple different techniques and this video will provide an overview of some of those techniques in a summary form and then present you some suggestions on which ones to use and which ones not to use. For validity, uh, measurement validation is a conceptual argument so it, you cannot test validity empirically. You can provide some evidence that supports your validity claim but validity of whether uh, the varia variance of the construct causes variations in, in the indicators it is ultimately a theoretical argument that you, can, uh, you cannot prove empirically. Nevertheless there are some techniques that are commonly applied. Factor analysis is the most important technique for assessing validity. Factor analysis can be used for three different purposes. One is to assess whether indicators have a common cause. If indicators have a, a common cause or if they have zero variation that's an indication that they could measure the same thing. Then uh, the second purpose is to assess common method variance. If one factor explains the majority of the data, correlations and data, then that's an indication that your measurement method could be driving the correlations. There are also more refined techniques that allow you to test uh, or assess method variance and uh, the, the actual factors at the same time. Then factor analysis is also used for discriminant validity assessment. The idea of discriminant validity is that two scales are discriminant valid or are empirically distinct if the factor correlation is well below one. The idea is that uh, if, if two factors correlate at 0 0.99 for example then it's difficult to claim that those two factors represent two different things. So discriminant validity is whether two, uh, two scales are empirically distinct. Then uh, factor analysis makes some assumptions that must be checked if or some of them can't be checked in which case they have to be uh, justified based on existing theory. Exploratory factor analysis assumes that all relationships are linear and the error terms in the factor analysis are independent. The confrontatory factor analysis approach is more flexible. It only assumes that the model is correctly specified and uh, you can model nonlinear relationships in which case you would be doing item response theory analysis or you can model measurement defects, correlated error, secondary factors and so on. But it's important the model is correctly specified because otherwise uh, it's not a proper test of your theory. Minimal reporting of exploratory factor analysis is which factor rotation techniques you used. You should always use the, uh, the direct oblimin rotation. Then factor loading pattern. So you uh, report uh, if you have 10 indicators and, and four factors then you have a table of, of four columns and 10 rows and then you have a factor loading for each indicator factor pair and then you highlight the highest ones so that it's easy to, easier to see the pattern in the loadings. Confrontatory factor analysis you uh, report the estimated factor loadings and uh, the chi-square statistic, the decrease of freedom and the p-value. If the p-value is rejected then you also, uh, if the p-value rejects the, uh, the model then you also need to report what kind of diagnostics you did for the confrontatory factor analysis. Then we have the second technique is construct validity assessment with regression analysis or with correlations. The idea of this technique is that you have different measures that could correlate and they are supposed to measure different things. Then you have a theoretical expectation of how the constructs that those indicators measure behave. So the theoretical expectations are called the nomological network. So you have the causal relationships, their directions and, th and strengths and uh, then you compare if your empirical relationships between the measures match the theoretical expectations. If they do then you conclude that you may have construct validity. The assumption here is that the nomological network or all the theoretical relationships are known a prior and this is very difficult to satisfy in practice because we typically we are testing new theory in articles. If a theory is new, it has never been tested before, then how could we possibly know that it's correct? We can't. The minimum reporting is uh, regression coefficient, it's standard error and p-value. These are normally not reported as a table, instead they're reported in the text, so you're saying which relationships you expect, 
Then you have parentheses including the regression coefficient and standard error and the p-value in the parentheses telling uh, that uh, whether the expected relationship was observed or not. Then you uh, discuss whether the regression coefficients match your theoretical expectations. Then you have uh, theoretical arguments and this is really seen but this is a very important thing and uh, the theoretical argument is that the idea of validity is that there are variance of construct causes variance in inner items. That's one definition of measurement validity. The, the conceptual theoretical argument must answer the question of why we should expect the construct variation to cause variation in the data. So we have to uh, explain what is the process uh, that through which the construct causes people to respond to survey in a particular way for example. The assumption is that the argument is logical and supported by prior theory. Then we have principal component analysis which is sometimes used but it's not useful for measurement validation. People are incorrectly apply principal component analysis as a factor analysis technique. It is not a factor analysis technique, it's a data summarization technique and it's uh, not useful for any of these purposes that we use factor analysis for. Then reliability. Reliability, uh, we have to uh, consider two important things. The reliability of the, the scale scores that we calculate as the mean or sum of the items. And uh, then we need to quantify the, the reliability of the scale score and we do that by using reliability indices. So reliability indices tell us what is the reliability of scale score. There are many different variations or many different types of reliability indices and they differ, they differ in the assumptions that they make. The most commonly used is the tau equivalent reliability or alpha which assumes that the indicators are unidimensional measures of, of one thing. All items are equally reliable and our measurement there is purely random. Then we have the second most popular is the congeneric reliability or composite reliability or coefficient omega which assumes uh, unidimensionality and random measurement there. The difference here is that congeneric reliability allows the indicators to differ in their individual reliabilities. The minimum reporting that you do is you have to explain why you chose a particular index and then you have to justify the assumptions and explain how they were checked if they were and then the actual value of the index. Then we have test retest correlation and uh, it can be used to assess the reliability of individual measures or scale scores. The idea was that we measure uh, one thing now and then we measure the same thing a week later. If the two measures correlate that indicates on reliability. This technique makes two assumptions. First of all the assumption is that uh, the, the delay between the measures must be sufficiently long so that the informant gets the reset. So if we remember what we answered the last time to a question then our test retest doesn't work. So it assumes that we uh, don't remember our previous answer. That's the reason for the delay. Then it also assumes that the delay is not long enough or too long so that the trait that we are measuring is relatively stable. So if we measure uh, a child's height now and then uh, two years from now then whether the, those two measures are not the same, it's not the indication of unreliability, it's indication of that the, the kid has grown during that time. So the trait must be stable. Then uh, minimum reporting, you should justify the delay and then you test three test correlations that you report those. So justify the delay, it's not too long, not too short and then uh, report the actual correlations. Then we have standardized factor loadings and Standardized factor loadings are used to assess individual reliability and reliability. So the square of standardized factor loading is an estimation of in, estimate of individual item reliability. Assumptions are the, the, the ones that you make in your factor analysis and then uh, typically the factor analysis reporting is interpreted as it is and uh, you don't need to report anything special for this reliability estimate. Then there is average variance extracted which is sometimes used and uh, this is redundant with others. So uh, there is really no reason to use it 
and uh, it's one index for a scale but it is not a reliability index in the same sense as these others here because it doesn't quantify what is the reliability of the sum and uh, you need to report the factor loadings anyway that go into the average variance extracted index so uh, the AVE really doesn't give any, any additional value beyond the standardized factor loadings that you uh, would normally report anyway. So finally, uh, how do you assess reliability and validity evidence reported by others? And I have two roles. Uh, when you're reading published work and when you're reviewing work for publication. So when you're a conference or journal reviewer. And we have a couple, I have four scenarios here and what to do in these scenarios. Uh, one is common is the factor analysis is missing and uh, if what do you do about it? So factor ana analysis is the most important tool for validation and what if the authors don't uh, don't report that at all? So uh, they could say that uh, it was conducted, the results were okay, they don't report it or they don't say anything about factor analysis at all. If the scale has been previously validated in, in multiple different studies and the previous validation evidence is valid. The fact that a scale has been applied before and some, statistic has been, some statistics have been reported about that scale doesn't mean that it has actually been validated because for example uh, the people who present the scale could have used principal component analysis which is not useful for scale validation and then they nevertheless get to publish the paper. So is there actual prior evidence that you can check? If yes then it's probably okay. If you're a reviewer of somebody's work and they uh, present a multiple item scale and don't present the factor analysis then you should require a revision that includes the factor analysis results. Then uh, we have uh, reliability statistic reported without checking the assumptions. This is uh, the, the default case so um, use coefficient alpha without even knowing what the assumptions are. The if you are reviewing somebody's reading a published work then uh, it's useful to know that the reliability statistics are uh, even if the assumptions are not fulfilled completely the results may not be that severe so uh, you could probably trust the results. If you are reviewing somebody else's work for publication then require that the authors justify the chosen reliability coefficient and report how the assumptions were checked. Then uh, the fourth case, third case is that there is some evidence that you don't really understand. So the authors discuss something about reliability and validity. They use some weird index that you have never never heard about like, like greatest lower, lowest bound GLB or what, whatever. You don't understand what it means. So what do you do about it? Then uh, if you're a reader of the paper then uh, if there is some other evidence that you know how to interpret and you can make a decision of whether to trust the results using that other evidence then it's probably okay to ignore the evidence that you don't understand. Another alternative is that this is a learning opportunity for you. So study the technique and uh, importantly you should study the techniques using uh, sources that are trustworthy because particularly in measurement there are these guideline types articles that basically say that uh, this has been applied before therefore it's a good practice it should be applied uh, in the future. That the fact that something has been applied before doesn't make it a valid technique. So there are uh, articles that advocate techniques not because of the merits of the techniques but because the technique has been used previously and the authors think that that is evidence for its validity. Trustworthy sources include, for example, organizational research methods. So you can basically trust that the, what's said in the journal makes sense. Uh, other journals, psychological methods is okay. A good book about measurement is okay as well. If you're reviewing work by somebody else and uh, you don't understand the statistics that they apply, then ask the authors to explain that in the paper. If you don't understand what the statistic tells you, then it's possible that other readers don't understand it either. Coefficient alpha, most people probably have an idea of what it means. Greatest lower bound statistic, 
most people in management probably have no clue what it does. So then it's, it's useful for uh, the article to educate the readers a bit. So uh, tell, ask the authors to tell what the index, how it's interpreted, why it was used, what kind of assumptions it makes, and uh, then cite appropriate papers to support that it's actually a useful index for the purpose that the authors are using it for. Then we have uh, the final case, cross-sectional survey ignores common method variance and there is no uh, assessment or Harman single factor test, which is a really weak, weak test. Then uh, what you should do uh, when you read published work? Well, uh, in published work, you can check the correlations. If all the indicators or all the measures correlate with one another, then that's an indication that there's a method variance problem. If uh, there are sets of indicators that are only weakly correlated, then that's evidence that there probably is not a method variance problem. If there are objective measures and uh, or items that are specific instead of being uh, like asking person's feelings, then you can probably trust the results. If you're reading work by others, uh, require that the authors uh, apply a confrontative factor analysis with a method factor and if they have marker indicators, those should be used as well. And then uh, the authors also should mention the limitations of the technique that they apply for considering method variance problems, because not all of these techniques work really well in all scenarios. So every time uh, when you review work by others, the main thing that you do is uh, in, in the methods part, is to make people justify their decisions so that you understand why they measure their decisions. Then you make, uh, then you can make a call whether that decision is justified or not.